Well, good morning, church. Hey, welcome to First Christian Church. Your vision is what? Let's try that again. Your vision is? Great job. All right. So, Chris, you're doing a good job. Thumbs up. He was over here uh, first service, so I'm going to have to look up there to, to him now. He's in the balcony. He said he's going to pro- put his feet up and watch me. If you're a visitor and you're saying, who is this guy? My name is Todd Payton, and I am a Timothy of First Christian Church. Chris was my youth pastor, and we were trying to figure it out uh, before um, the service, and my timing might be off a little bit, but I believe he came here when I was 14 years old, and I'm 52 now, so do the math. Uh, but what I want to say there is you are very blessed to have Chris Gregg as your uh, pastor. Amen? Chris has been a youth pastor to me. He has been a good friend and a mentor for however many years that was, 36, 38 years, whatever it's been. Um, I gave my life, uh, uh, or excuse me, I, I grew up in the circus tent. Anybody remember the circus tent that was back here in the parking lot? I grew up in the circus tent. Um, I, w- I made a decision to follow Christ when I was nine years old in that building. Uh, Glenn Liston was the pastor at the time, and um, he baptized me in, in the big giant baptistry that we had at that point in time. My wife and I were married in that church, and it will be 30 years this June since that uh, you know, um, I was ordained in this church. I preached one of my very first sermons in this church in 2008. It was a great service. My dad at the time was the chairman of the elders and got to be a, a part of that service. Um, and, you know, uh, my brother's family is here. My parents have been here. I thought it had only been like 40 some years. My mom and I talked about it. It's been 50 years that my parents have been a part of this church. Church, I'm telling you this because this is home for me. And I just want to say a thank you to Chris and to all the leadership here for allowing me to come this morning and share my heart with all of you. Uh, When I was in grade school at Forest Park Elementary, I was placed in speech therapy. Anybody else out there placed in speech therapy when they were a kid? Uh, A few of you. I struggled saying certain words. It it was kind of embarrassing for me um, because, you know, they would pull you out of class. They'd put you in a little room off to the side of the library, away from everybody, and the reason it was really embarrassing for me, and there's a lot of you out here uh, that have known me for many years, and some of you have no idea who I, I am, but I was, uh, I was already made fun of in school. You see, I was six foot five when I was in fourth grade. So, you know, um, I was the only fourth grader with a mustache and a beard. Uh, you know, uh, people were making fun of me at that age. And, and also, as you grew that tall, um, my coordination didn't work very well. So I'd just be walking along and I'd trip over the carpet. Uh, so I was already a target to be made fun of. And I tell you all this because of struggling with words, and I still, to this day, struggle. So I'm just going to tell you, as I preach, I'll probably mess up a few words, and I'm asking for God's grace in that. But I'm here to tell you that I don't think my speech therapist would have recommended me for public speaking as a living. So I am a perfect example to all of you here this morning that God has a sense of humor, all right? But here I am to tell you the truth. I absolutely love what I do. Love it. I love to preach. Um, being in front of people uh, has has never you know been a problem for me. Usually, when I was younger, I, when I was in front of people, I was making a fool of myself. Hopefully, I don't do that this morning. But um, do you know, for most people, that isn't so. the The number one fear of people is what? Anybody know? It's public speaking. Uh, the number uh, two fear uh, of people is death. So, um, church, just so you know, most of you would rather be dead right now than doing what I'm doing right now. So if you're thinking you're all alone or, you know, a moment like what I'm doing freaks you out, you are in good company because probably 90% of you would not want to be up here doing what I'm doing. I actually had that conversation with my brother this morning walking in. He did the communion meditation and I said, hey, you want to trade? And uh, he goes, "Uh, no, I'm I'm good. We're wired differently. Uh, A few years ago, I was challenged by a friend with this question right here. What if you could hear the cries of hell for 30 seconds? Now let that sink in just for a minute. What if you could hear the cries of hell for 30 seconds? 
I was out in the audience watching this. Um, I was the pastor over at uh, Union Christian Church at the time, and we had a missionary come in, and he shared that with me. And ever since that day, I have had an increasingly urgency to share my faith. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But before we get into that, I, I want to share some statistics with you, maybe just to give you an idea of how urgent we should be about sharing our faith. Twelve churches a day close their doors. Twelve churches a day close their doors. The average pastor's age is 54, so I'm two years underneath the average age. Uh, it's 54. They're saying that in 10 to 15 years, if um, something doesn't change in the, in the world of the church, that the church is going to have a, a big struggles of filling uh, ministry positions. It already is. If you sit on leadership and you're hiring somebody to be on staff um, or something, you're finding out very, uh, very simply that it's very difficult to find a candidate that fits what you're looking for because there just aren't the people to fill the positions. Christian universities are closing their doors. St. Louis Christian has closed their doors. Cincinnati closed their doors a few years ago. And I got my undergrad from Lincoln Christian University, and they're closing at the end of May. And probably the last statistic that probably just really speaks to me and just sets on me, 72 people die a minute without Jesus. Now, I want you to think about that. If I preach for 30 minutes today, which you'll be lucky if that's all I do, but if I speak for 30 minutes today, 2,160 people will have died not knowing the loving grace of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Church, we are living in a time like no other, and we need to show the urgency in our mission. And our mission is to share the gospel message, church. So let's look at the life of Paul, who honestly speaks directly to this. And I hope you know, and I hope that you learn through all this, that you don't have to be elegant. You don't have to be a professional. You just need to be you. When it comes to sharing Jesus with others, as followers of Jesus, we should be ready to share our faith. Scripture tells us, make the most of every opportunity in the book of Colossians. In 1 Peter, we read, and if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But are you? I mean, we've already established most of you are fearful of any kind of public speaking. Are you actually ready? Could you say right now you are comfortable and ready to share your faith if the opportunity came to you? So here's what you need to know starting out, church. God cares for and has equipped each of us to do mighty and wonderful things. Amen? I'm going to tell you, I told first service, you're going to have to respond to me. I like an audience that responds. Few people in history have been more effective at being a light in the darkness than the Apostle Paul. He led thousands to Jesus. He started churches and wrote much of the New Testament uh, of the Bible. But even the great apostle Paul, he freaked out. He felt inadequate at some of his moments in time. So Paul here, he's writing a letter to the early church in Corinth about the magnitude of what Jesus did for all of us and how that shapes our very existence. And in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, he says this to the followers of Jesus. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with elegance or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Now, I don't know about you, but that kind of helps me right there. As a kid who still can't say Munster right, did you catch it? Anybody catch that? I say Munster. My wife corrects me every single time. If she was here right now, she'd be like, you're saying it wrong, Todd. All right. It's monster, I guess. But I say Munster wrong. I say other words wrong. But it helps me to know that a guy like Paul, church, Bible guy, writer of scripture, preacher of the gospel, missionary to foreign lands, he struggled also. He struggled, church, to speak elegantly. Paul was a highly trained intellectual. But he says, when I'm trying to be a light, when I'm trying to share the message, I just use simple words. Simple words. I don't try to be elegant. I don't try to depend on my human wisdom. There's a verse of scripture in the next uh, uh, letter, 2 Corinthians, and many of the Corinthian people didn't really affirm Paul all that much. And Paul gives a little recap of what they've been saying about him. And I want you to listen to what the people are saying about Paul. Now think about who this is. This is Paul. Most of us have heard of Paul. Most of us revere who Paul is. And they say to, for some say, Paul's letters are demanding and forceful. 
but in person, he is weak and his speeches are worthless. Meaning, what, you, know, you know, Paul would write a letter, uh, read any of his letters. They're, they're forceful, they're demanding, they're powerful. But when he would get up to speak, it was a snooze fest. Like people would fall asleep. Hopefully no one's sleeping yet. But he would fall asleep, right? Or people would fall asleep. They, they didn't like to, to hear him speak that much. And remember, at this point in time, uh, we're coming out of the age of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and it was known for the intellectual oratory. And that's the backdrop of Paul's ministry. And so there's this flawed, broken man doing his best to make it work, and yet the impact is unbelievable. Paul's responsible for 13 books in the New Testament and for planting churches all over the Mediterranean. It's safe to say Paul had it figured out. And over the last 16 years as a preacher, I've come to realize what Paul knew. I know Chris has come to realize what Paul knew. You see, uh, uh, Paul says here, or it's, um, my job is not to sound good. My job is not to sound smart. My job is, is, is not to be funny. Thank goodness, right? But Paul says in this very text, I may not be very impressive, uh, but I share something called the testimony of God, the story of God, the heart of God for you and for me through the scriptures. That's my job, church. As a pastor, my job is not to weigh in on politics. My job is not to give you stock market tips. My job is not to tiptoe around the gospel message. My job is to tell you the story of God. His very excellence. His very truth. The heart of a father pouring out on a, on a page, sharing and proclaiming that you have what it takes. Church, listen to me. You have what it takes to make a difference, to, to make a dent, to be a light in a dark place, to transform this church, uh, to transform the world, your neighborhood by sharing God's story. And here's what's so cool. Because God cares about us so much, his story and our story are wrapped together as one. They're intertwined. He continues in verse two, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says, uh, that, that's where our focus should be, church. It's not complicated. Ultimately, it's just a simple message about Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross where he made a payment for our sin that, that we never could have paid. Do you realize that we have no hope without Jesus Christ? We could not have paid for our own sin. That's, that's what it's all about. You, you see, here's what's cool about Christianity and about the church, and, and here's what's so central. And if you're, if you're in here this morning and you're exploring Christianity or you're trying to figure this out, make sure to pay attention to this. Paul says, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. Let's remember, church, we sit on the other side of the resurrection. There's glory in that. But for several thousand years, the cross was a symbol of humiliation. And so Paul says, look, Christ Jesus, his work on the cross, his redeeming work on the cross is what I believe in and what I live for. Now, my guess is if we went around this room, it's a pretty large room, pretty good group of people here. I'm trying to look up there also. My guess is there's some darkness. My guess is there's some hurt or some pain in this room. You might say, well, I'm an alcoholic or I'm an addict or I, I struggle with depression or I have battled anxiety in my life or, or maybe I have tremendous doubt about the future. And, and do you know what happens with all of that? Uh, you see, on the cross of Christ, our inadequacies, mine inadequacies are buried in the grave and become platforms for God's glory, church. Listen, this is not a country club. This is a hospital for the broken. And, and you know what I've noticed when I, when I share or, or, or when I talk to other people and listen to them share their testimony of God, uh, uh, what God has done in their life, it always comes down to this very simple template. Now, I want you to think about your story. Think about your story. Think about how you came to Christ. Tell me it doesn't match up to what's going to be on this screen here in a minute. I was, then Jesus, and now I am. I struggle with porn. Then Jesus showed me I don't need to be held captive by that. And now I'm free and I help other people get free. 
I was riddled by anxiety and then Jesus gave me peace and now I live free, I live secure. I was addicted to drugs and then Jesus made me whole and now I'm free and I'm no longer a captive. I don't worry about what might happen or could happen. I trust in the one who makes peace happen. Does your story fit that model? Years ago, I was at a uh, planning session. For those of you that, that don't know me well, well, I was a, a bricklayer for 15 years before I became a pastor. And then I went off to North Carolina to be a youth pastor. And I was at this Carolina Christian um, um, youth conference meeting. And we would get together at this hotel and we'd plan this conference we had in February. And it was for, um, you know, about 1,500 students we'd have come out. And we're at this meeting and, and every night or uh, the, the night we were there, we would go out to dinner and we would take the shuttle bus and it would take, drop us off, pick us up at the restaurant, take us back. So the bus comes to pick us up and it's a, about a 15 passenger shuttle bus. And there's about eight or nine youth pastors and we all get up, at, um, you know, onto the, uh, uh, onto the bus and three ladies get on the bus with us. Now, I'm pretty sure they didn't know they were getting on the bus with eight youth pastors. But they get on the bus with us and they, they sit down and, you know, we, we start heading back and we're talking like a 15 minute ride. Okay. And just some pleasantries. Hi, how are you doing? That type of stuff. And then the rest of us are talking and they're talking among themselves. Now I have to show you this. Now I know some of you will say, Todd, you made that up to be dramatic and I'm not making this up. This is exactly kind of how it happened. Okay. I'll do my best to, to give it to you. But um, there was a, a pastor there from a very small church um, and, you know, they didn't have a youth pastor or anything. And he was an older gentleman and stuff. And I'm not, you know, anything about him or, or nothing, but we're on, we're on this bus and having these conversation and they're down there having their conversation. And he looks down like this and he goes, do you know Jesus? And what do you think happened? At that moment, all of us put our heads down, started praying for our brother, started praying for these young ladies, because these young ladies, I believe, if they could have clawed their way out of the bus, they would have left. And I could be wrong, but it felt very counterproductive to me. You see, we want to speak confidently. We want to speak boldly. But you don't need to corner some poor soul on a 15-minute bus ride back to the hotel. You don't need to memorize 45,637 verses. You just need to tell the story of your testimony, church. I was, and then Jesus, and now I'm. And maybe you're thinking, well, Todd, that's great, but I'm still worried. I, I'm still unsure. I, I still don't know, uh, you know, even know why it matters to share or, or to speak confidently. Well, if you have some fear about this, remember, you're not alone. I, I love uh, what the message, I'm going to use the message paraphrase. I, I, I hope that's okay here. I love what it says here. Uh, first two verses. You'll remember, friends, uh, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's sheer genius, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus and who he is, and then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. So it's so relieving for all of us, right? God is counting on us, but he doesn't expect all of us to have a master's in public speaking. He doesn't expect all of you to be a, a pastor who speaks up front every week. He wants us to keep it plain and simple. He wants us to tell our story. And you know what? Every one of you, every one of you has a story. Church, you need to be ready and willing to share your faith because the opportunities are always there. I think that if all of you take time to pray and plan to share your faith, you're going to find as you move forward and as you invest in relationships, that doors will be open so you can eventually invite people to this church. You'll realize you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be a professional communicator. You can just be yourself. Paul says in verse three, I came to you in weakness with what? What's it look like? What's it say? It's fear and trembling. I don't know about you. I read that and I think, man, great. I'm on the same page as Paul, right? I read that and I think, boy, the apostle Paul, this great guy, right, who planted all these churches, who did such amazing things, he actually had fear and trembling in his life. I think we all get fearful. I used the example with Chris. I, I think, you know, some of us might look, you might look at a pastor and think, boy, a pastor never gets fearful or, or probably never gets in that situation. I've been in moments and I'm sure Chris has, and I'm sure all of you have, it happens and it's okay. 
But the reason is we're always afraid. A few things happen. We're afraid first that, that, that we're going to say the wrong thing. You might not admit that, but, uh, but the opportunity comes and you think, man, what if I say something that's not right? What if I make a mistake? So we back off. Or, or then, then we think, man, we're, I'm going to share my faith with a, with a friend. And then we get around that friend and we think, man, I, I, don't, I don't know about that because, you know, if I share my faith with my friend and they don't take it very well, then they'll probably alienate me and I'd rather have my friendship than tell them about Jesus. Or our neighbor that we see, you know, out ever so often, we wave at him or we say hi to him or, or whatever, and we think, man, I, I just need to this time. This time I'm going to walk over there as I, I go to get my mail and I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And then we think, man, what if I tell them about it and they take it wrong and they put a big six-foot fence ac- across the yard and block us off? Here's the saddest thing. I would say that most of us probably struggle to tell people about Jesus who are in our family. I might be like, hey, man, I- I'm going to share my faith with my uncle this Thanksgiving. Like, I-, I know I need to. I've been praying about it and I've been building it up and I've been studying. I've been, I've been talking to God about it and I'm so excited about it. And then you get to Thanksgiving and you get a full stomach, right? And you're sitting and you're watching some football game and, and you're all sitting there and you're laughing and you're having a good time and you love your uncle so much and you know he needs Jesus, but I just can't. Not this year, God. Maybe next year. Maybe next year, God. We're afraid they'll think we're some kind of weird fanatic. So what resource did Paul lean on to help him with his fear? Don't miss this. Verses four through five. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the what? The Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. And one more time, here's what the message says. This is so encouraging. I want you to sink into your hearts as I'm reading it. I was unsure of how to go about this and felt totally inadequate. This is Paul speaking. I was scared to death. If you want the truth of it, And so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else, but the message came through anyway. You see, God's spirit and God's power did it, which made it clear that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not to some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anyone else. I love that. It's not by God's power that you come to Christ because of the way I preach or because of the way Chris preached. It's because of the spirit's power working in us to make a conviction in your life, church. Paul says, I just talk very plainly and simple, and I just depend on the Holy Spirit's power. I depend on God's power to speak through me in these moments and do what the words of a human could never do. And church, never forget, we cannot do it without Jesus. We don't stand a chance without Jesus. Friends, you you and I are never alone in these kinds of conversations. God's power, the Spirit's power is ready to enable you to boldly speak Jesus. I depend on that every time. I get the opportunity to preach. I want, I want all of you to know, I've been praying for this church for the last month or so as I knew I was gonna get an opportunity to share this message with you. I've been praying for hearts to be changed. I've been praying uh, for a seed to be planted, for, for a, a life to be changed, for someone who doesn't know the gospel. I've been praying for those of you who, who have been putting off sharing the message with a friend or family member or neighbor to just leave here and want to share that message. You see, it's so important for us to do this, to be urgent about um, the, the power within us. And do you realize in here that, that each of you, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, I think we forget this, each of you who've given your life to Christ, made that confession of faith, been baptized, you came out with the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead. And I think so many times what's so sad about us as Christians is we forget that. We don't believe that we have that power. And I'm telling you, you have that power. All you have to do is be willing to be used by God. So for me, you know, uh, speaking in front of people, like I said, has always kind of come natural, but the words and the content, I seem to fumble at times. And a lot of times I get off stage more times than I can count. And I think, well, that fell flat. You know, I got some people over here that used to go to UCC with me. And um, I would, I would look at Zach, my buddy, and I'd say, Hey, Zach, that really, really fell flat. And he, he might say, man, that was the best sermon I ever heard. And then I would look at Zach and say, where did you go to church today? You know, um, because he evidently wasn't listening to me. Right. Uh, But seriously, what makes it all worth it is seeing lives changed for the gospel. There is nothing better. I'm telling you, church, listen to me. Nothing better than seeing lives changed for the gospel message. 
I get excited when I see someone say yes to Jesus and get baptized. Uh, if I don't know the person, I'll often approach them. I'll ask them, hey, wh- what happened? Or how did you get to where you're at? And you know what they always tell me? All, almost all the time, they tell me their story and they say, a coworker reached out, a best friend asked them to come. My brother-in-law, my boss, one of my staff members, my grandma, my grandpa, uh, someone had someone was willing to invite them. Almost every time, it's someone who reached out to them, willing and ready to share the gospel message. And their lives were changed and their eternity was changed. One of the greatest compliments is to see someone you reached out to or witnessed to come to know Jesus. I'm telling you, church, uh, to see a transformation in a person's life and just know that, listen to me, just, just know that, that God used just a little bit of you, right? Just a small part of you to make a difference in somebody's life. And you get to be a part of that and you get to witness that. If you've never experienced that, you are missing out. I, 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 there is nothing better. I, I call it a God rush. It might be a wrong thing to say, but it is a rush to be used by God to see somebody's light just go off and their life is given over to Jesus and then they start living for him. It's amazing. So I got to ask you, church, who's the person you need to share Jesus with? Can you see their face? I don't want you to miss this. God's son, God's love, God's grace is for everyone. We don't get to pick and choose. We don't get to decide who gets to hear the message. His grace, his love is for everyone, church. And listen to me carefully. Carefully, God's power and God's spirit is with you to enable and empower you in every one of these conversations. Now, I know many of you will say, but I'm just not like that. That's not me. I'm not the kind of person that you can drop in the middle of a room and just carry on conversation. I'm the person who likes to sit over in the corner and talk to one or two people and have that conversation or whatever. And you know what? Most people are wired like you. Again, I bring up my brother. My brother and I are not wired the same at all. If he was in here, he would amen that, right? He's always been the cool, calm, collective one. And I've always been the wild, wiggly, goofy one, right? It's just the way it is. If you pop me in a room of 30 or 40 people, I'm talking to everybody. If you drop him off, um, he's probably going to go over in the corner against the wall and talk to three or four people. It's just the way we are. But you know what I've learned? God's going to use me to reach people and God's going to use him to reach people. I believe when Paul said to be ready and make every opportunity to count, that he was conveying that, that God made you precisely the way he did. That when you said yes to Jesus, you were given a power inside of you to reach someone who can only be reached by someone just like you. So church, I'm challenging you. Depend on the Spirit's power to work through your own style, your own way. Do you understand that? We are not going to reach everybody the same way. There are people in my congregation I'll never reach, but there are people who have better talents than me who will reach them. And there are people they won't reach and there are people that I'll reach. Same thing here. You guys have a great church. Use everybody to tell the message. For many of you, you can share the gospel message just by making simple spiritual deposits into the lives of your kids. You know, research shows uh, that a mom or dad's involvement at just an average simple level, just as reading uh, to kids at night, sharing a meal together each day, praying before you eat, going to church with them, just having simple conversations about God, seeing how you handle things, the role of God plays in your life is a a huge spiritual impact on on the lives of your, your kids. Last month, my team and I, we actually came up to Mooresville, Indiana, and we went to a conference uh, called the uh, uh, called the Grow Younger. It was put on by E2 Elders. And, and one of the speakers was Jason France. He's, he's the president of um, uh, CIY. It's Christ and Youth Conference. And he, he put this big chart up on the screen for everybody to see. And he, he shared this with us. He said, the, the best opportunity to reach a child for Christ is between the ages of 9 and 14. I want you to think about that. There might be somebody in here that's between those ages. Some of you parents in this room have kids that are between the ages of nine and 14. Church, listen to me and don't miss this. What a child believes by the age 14 is most likely what they will die believing. Chris and I could tell you as being youth pastors, the the most influence I had with a kid when I was a youth pastor was sixth grade to ninth grade. I gave my life to Christ when I was nine. I fit at the very beginning of that. Think about your story. When did you come to follow Christ? What do you still believe to this day? Don't dismiss the power of the Holy Spirit working in you as a parent. Hear me, parents. It is the most important thing you will do in your entire life to lead your kids to Christ. In the New Testament book, 2 Timothy, we read about two women that put on a clinic and being a light to the next generation at home. 
Paul is writing to a young man of tremendous faith and character named Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. And Paul says this, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. I am persuaded now lives in you also. Now, now where did Timothy learn about his faith? Uh, who did he live it? Who, who did he learn it from? His grandma, right? His grandma. So let me say a quick word to grandparents if I can. First of all, how many of your grandparents? Raise your hand if you're a grandparent. Come on, everybody get your hands up there. Don't you love being a grandparent? Anybody in here not like being a grandparent? Everybody loves it, right? Like, I cannot wait. I said it first service, I'll say it again in case she's watching now. Madison, I, anytime, let's go, right? Ready to go, all right? Bad thing is, she tells me it's going to be till, not till she's 30, which is a few more years. But man, I, I'm excited about it. Uh, my brother, uh, you know, he, he's already a grandpa or whatever, Pops. I think that's what they call him, right? Pops. So, uh, and he's just really so good with, uh, with uh, little man Brooks, which is up there in the audience somewhere. <clears throat> but, you know, one thing I've learned is grandparents love people to ask about their grandkids, right? Like, so, gr- grandparents, I'm talking to you for a moment. Is your grandchild seeing Jesus in you? Does your grandchild get any sense from you how much he or she matters to God from you? Does your grandchild get any sense of what a fully surrendered follower of Jesus looks like from you? The point is, don't underestimate your influence to pass the baton of faith to your grandkids. Your role is vitally important. Church, being willing to share your faith starts at home. Starts at home. You know, I don't have this written down. I'm going to add this, and I hope it's all right. But um, you know, a statistic that just popped in my head: if 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 the if the father comes to Christ first, ninety three percent of families will probably come to Christ. And I'm sure that's not the first time you've heard that. So, fathers, if you're in here, you got to step it up. Lead your family. but be willing to share at home. And then, you know what? Share your faith by loving your neighbors, your food servers, the people at your gym or coffee shop or from work. You know, they say that servers at restaurants, they can't stand the Christian crowd. They can't stand the church crowd because they're poor tippers and they're mean when they come in. Think about that when you go out to eat today. How could you bless someone's life? Maybe ask them their name. Maybe take five minutes to talk to them. Maybe even offer to pray with them. Maybe bless them with a little larger tip than you usually would do. Make a difference in someone's life. And in your conversation, invite them to come to church because here's what I've learned. You just never know where that will lead. Another little ad here. I'm sorry, Dan, but I can walk to my office every morning. I could walk across the parking lot and be in my office every morning. I've made it a habit. I get in my truck. I drive a couple miles down the road. I go to a Speedway gas station there in town. I, I get me a couple bottles of water and a, and, a, and a cup of ice. And I've gotten to know um, two people, Gib and Kitty. And Kitty works in the cafe and, and Gib works behind the counter. And in the time I've gotten to know him, Gib has asked me to pray for his daughter who has cancer three or four different times. I just talked to Kitty before I came here, and she said, when you get back, make sure you tell me when church starts. I want to come hear you at church. I don't say that for anything that I do or any pat on the back. I'm just telling you, you never know the difference you'll make if you're just willing to deposit a little bit here and there in people's lives. My parents had great friends. Wonderful. They still have great friends. When I was three years old, those friends kept on my mom to, to come to church. My mom had been raised in the church. My dad had been church some, but they weren't very regular anywhere. And they started coming here to First Christian and it changed their lives forever. I've never seen a man study the word of God like my dad ever. Uh, uh, their lives changed forever. They raised Tony and I to be Christian men. As you can see, my brother now serves as chairman of the elders here at First Christian. I'm a senior pastor. I don't say that for pats on the back or, hey, celebrate the Paytons or nothing like that. I'm telling you, what if Pat and Larry Stuckey, which most of you know, what if they thought it wasn't important enough to share their faith with my parents? What if they would have said, you know what? I don't want to make things awkward. Um, you know, we really like the, the Paytons. We don't want to um, alienate them. We, we don't want to um, uh, do whatever. Uh, 
what if that would have happened? I want you to think about the impact that my parents have had in 50 years at this church. I want to think about the impact that my brother has had in his ministry. I want you to think about the impact that I've had as a senior pastor. Listen, church, you never know who you're going to share the faith with and what that's going to do for their family. But I know that the Stuckey, starting with my parents, changed generation after generation after generation because we're raising our kids to love Jesus. And my hope is they will raise their kids and their kids and their kids. Think about that. Think about the impact you can have in someone's life. You don't have to be a public speaker. You don't have to stand up here and do what I do. You just have to be willing to let the Spirit use you. You know, just like they say that 20% of the people give 80% of the money in church, something I've noticed the longer I walk with Jesus, the longer I serve in churches, there are some who cannot contain their faith. There are some of you, you're so excited, you're, you're willing to share, you're telling your friends, you're sharing on social media, you're, you're, you're saying, hey, come to First Christian, it's a great church. You're, you're posting Chris's sermons, you're talking it up, you're, you're, you're bought in, you, you love Jesus, you want people to know. But there are those of you here, you're waiting for something bad to happen. You're waiting for the bottom to fall out. You just don't have time. So you come in the church and you worship, you hear a sermon, you walk out and you don't live out your faith the rest of the week and then you come back. Church, listen to me. I cannot imagine knowing what Jesus Christ did in my life, my personal life, and not want to share the gospel message. I can't imagine what he did. I can't imagine the hope that I have because listen, Jesus is hope for the world. And I don't know about you. I don't know if you've looked around very much, but our world is in dire need of hope. And Jesus is that only hope that we're ever gonna find. We don't have time not to share our faith. You know, one thing, they they say taxes and and, and death, but the one thing we are 100% guaranteed is death. Death comes for us all. I'm 52 years old. I've lived more than I have left. And whatever God grants me on this earth, I am going to share the gospel message to the day I die because I want as many people that I know to come to Christ and know him and have the hope of eternity in heaven. So who in your life needs to hear about Jesus? What if each each one of you uh, lean more into God's power, the Spirit's power, like the Apostle Paul to share your faith? Well, what if you started having strategic dinner parties with people you come in contact with and you built relationships with the idea of eventually inviting them here to First Christian? Well, what if you found creative ways to, to share your faith with your neighbors and decided right now that each of you would build a friendship with one person, listen, one lost person who doesn't know Jesus, and you're going to make it your mission that they'll be here next year because you've shared the message of the gospel with them? What kind of impact would that have on this church? You would, be, you would be talking about adding on to this church. I want you to know something about your family and friends and neighbors who seem so resistant to God and spiritual things. Deep down, you might make excuses for them, but they're really interested. How many of you in here have ever played hide and seek? Raise your hand if you played hide and seek. Not too many of you. So right after church, we're turning the lights out. We're going to play a game of hide and seek. All right. Everybody get ready. <clears throat> what's the object of hide and seek? Not to be found. It's not a trick question. Not to be found, right? That's the object. Uh, but, but the question is, did you ever not want to really be found? I mean, is there anybody in the audience right now that's like, it's been 10 years, like, hey, you haven't found me? I'm, I'm still hiding. Like, I bet there isn't, right? Because, you know, after five or 10 minutes of hiding, you probably thought, man, I picked a really good spot, but I don't want to be the last one. Or, So what do you do? You put a foot out or you put a hand out or you, you know, I don't know, your, your cell phone goes off, you know, you, you get, you get, you get noticed, right? By, by somebody, right? And then they come and find you and you say, oh, dang it. I lost. You see, we've all got people in our relational world who leave the impression that they don't want to be found. But if you carefully look around, church, there's a hand out. There's a foot out. There's a cry for help saying, you know what? I need something more. I need a God who loves me. I need a God who cares about me. 
I need a new start, a life. I need hope in my life. So let me ask you a question. Who's the one? Who's the one in your life that's going to sit in this chair? We got some empty chairs over here, some up there, over here. Who's the neighbor that's going to sit there because you shared the message of Jesus? Who's the coworker that you see every day and you just know that you need to share Jesus with, but you haven't? Who's, who's going to sit here? How about who's the family member? Who's the family member that's going to finally sit down here in this chair and one day we'll be able to look at you and say, thank you so much for sharing Jesus with me. Thank you for giving me the hope that I needed. Thank you that I get to spend eternity in heaven. Think about it. Who's the one? Because listen, church, you, you heard how I started the alternative. Imagine hearing the cries of hell for just 30 seconds. So who's the one that you place in this chair? And then, very simply, you don't get all, you know, biblical and all this great language and stuff. You just simply tell your story. I was a lost child, struggled all my life, struggled for years, made fun of, laughed at. I was the oddball out. My brother was always the cool kid. I was the nerdy, goofy, geeky, tall, clumsy, whatever. But then I encountered a man named Jesus. Jesus came into my life. Jesus changed my life. Jesus gave me hope. And now, and now I tell other people about what Jesus can do for them. And that's all you have to do, church. You do that and you depend on the Spirit to speak through you. And I promise you, you will make an impact for the gospel message. So tell me, church, who's the one that'll sit in this chair? If you haven't made a decision for Christ and you want to know more about him, Chris would love to meet you right down front here and tell you all about him. I'm praying for you, church. I'm praying for all of you. I'm praying that you leave here and you'll find one person. Just start with one. One person that a year from now or six months from now, whatever it is, they'll be in one of these chairs and they will be saying thank you to you because you changed their life for the gospel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we were able to come here this morning. We thank you for the message of the gospel. Father, it's so great to just come into your house and be able to worship and lift your name on high. It's such an honor and privilege to be at home, to be here among these people, to be able to just share this message, Lord. And Father, I pray right now, if there's someone in here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that they come down and they speak to Chris down front or if they don't want to come down in front of everybody, Lord, I pray they find a leader in the church or, or Dan or someone and they let them share the message with them. Father, I pray for uh, everyone in this room. Father, I pray, Lord, that, that, that they come to, come to know, Father, that the message is too important not to share with people. I pray that they, right now, in their eyes, as their eyes are closed, they picture that one person they want to share the gospel message with. And uh, Father, I pray that they... They don't put it off anymore, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen.